I have, have been having in mind a question of how can I separate Freud from psychoanalysis? Because I think that psychoanalysis has come to a kind of, itself has come to a kind of sort of mildly weak dead end as a therapy, as a, uh, you know, there are people for whom it works and people for whom it doesn't work. It's not a science that Freud had imagined it to be. <coughs> it's something else. And there is a great deal of, of important thinking that Freud does, which if you leave him within the psychoanalytic framework, you obscure his major, his major contributions to, to real... T Am I not holding it close enough? I see. It was, I got to learn how far it is. You know, like we, I'm not used to being a chanteuse. <laughs> anyway, anyway, in a certain sense, I'm attracted enormously to th the first, the, the, the three major books that argue for the presence of unconscious cogitation of some order or another, which got nominalized and concretized into the notion of the unconscious which is uh, kind of funny. Freud, most of Freud's suggestions in the, those three books are more suggestion-like and, and more tentative than his translators have allowed him to be, particularly his English translators. Uh, the, the, the books are, he, for example, there are imaginary terms that are introduced by either Ernest Jones or Brill for example, for many years when I was reading him back in, in high school at some point, I was interested in them as a psychoanalytic thinker, and I had to wonder, what the hell was a cathexis? When somebody said, the, the, this, this, his thinking undergoed a libidinal cathexis, so I figured, screw this, I read German as well as I read English, I'm going to find out what he said. And what he said was, what he referred to was a Besetzung. Now, when something is beset, if you are flying Lufthansa and you want to go to the bathroom <laughs> and it's occupied, it, the sign says besets. <laughs> so it, it also, an army that invests a, a city, it surrounds a city, the city may, be, may become, uh, may be occupied, the occupation of a, city, a hostile city, the city is besets. Now, that doesn't sound to me like cathexis, which sounds like an imaginary Greek term that you can't follow the meaning of in any serious way. And this runs throughout the account. I mean, Freud never had a word, the id. The, there was, what the hell is the id? It's Latin for it. And Freud called it the it, you know? He called it the it, the I and the it. Whatever the it was, it was it. So. Uh, I realized that even then, as I was reading him in high school and I was trying to figure out what the hell he had in mind, <coughs> I had to read him in German to be able to follow what in the world he was saying. Recently, somebody gave me a copy of a rather very good book, uh, Why, you know, Why We Laugh. Uh, a French psychoanalytic scholar was talking about his book, Witz und ihre Beziehung zu, uh, zu Unbekannt. That is to say, uh, wit or jokes and their relationship to the unconscious. Now, it's very funny because witz doesn't translate neatly into anything either. It doesn't translate directly into jokes. Sometimes it means strictly a play on words, like punning. But he was dealing with all kinds of jokes. The only thing he was also dealing with, his, he was first dealing with Jewish jokes. It's not too well known, although it is known that Freud in about 1895 was, was considering doing a collection of Jewish jokes and had collected a large number of them. In 1908, he burnt the collection. Uh, it is not entirely clear why he burnt it, but the book was intended to, the book about, about jokes and the unconscious was intended to generalize and universalize what might better have been rooted in a particular ethnicity and having the same relationship to universality than any ethnicity might have, but having a distinctive flavor. Because after all, Jewish jokes have a sound of great cynicism about them, which seems so typical of their character. And I was very interested in jokes, but it turned out I've been lately trying to figure out what Freud had in mind that is useful in this day and age to us in a meaningful way. And let me explain how I, how I see this. 
I have long advanced the for, uh, since since uh, more than ten years ago. I advanced the theory of narrative, which changes the nature of the game. And if it apply, if people accept it, it does something interesting. I've decided that after long thinking about it, that it is better to think of narrative and story as two separate cognitive modalities, which are often intertwined with each other. And then I re and I define story as a sequence of events and parts of events that lead to a significant transformation. So it's entirely a plot-driven style. And this is what almost all the, all the critics and theorists talk about, it's plot. Whether it's Roland Barthes or you, you name them, they're, they're only, only interested in plot. And it seemed to me that I was interested in narrative in a way that they weren't. They seemed to help, useless to me, Todorov and Barth and family, that I wondered what, what it was that got them to deal only with the mechanic, like a Boccaccio story treated as if it were an O. Henry story. You know, everything going on, tw you know, twists of, of, a logical, of a kind of logical and slightly surprising sequence. And I tried to examine what I meant, and what I, th what I thought I meant was central to all things I called narrative. It seemed to be they were those engagements of a desiring subject with the threat or promise, or threat and promise, of a transformation that this, this person or group of people, usually this person, would try to e either bring about or to overcome and prevent. So if the, uh, if the, if, if the storyline is essentially the external shell of, of narrative, and that narrative is the, the subjectivity confronting transformation, either positively or negatively, uh, you're dealing with two different things that may be found together, but they may also not be found together. They may be found distinctively. For example, if you read a crime story in a new daily newspaper, usually the crime story has been uh, gotten from the desk sergeant and who has taken the account of several witnesses and synthesized their, 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 their account of what happened. And their accounts of what happened a man came into the store with a, you know, with a drawn pistol, threatened the, uh, th threatened the man at the register, the cashier, ran off with $25 that was all that was in the till, and disappeared into, a, into a, 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 an alleyway between two slum buildings. Now, this was probably the result of several different witnesses' accounts, and nobody's desire is really given. That is, there's no subjectivity at all in the account because there's no subject. Uh, subject in the sense that there's nobody experiencing, nobody, the, nobody's desire is central to the shaping of the representation. And I said to myself, well, Freud has a case against narrativity in dreams, let us say, which interested me. It's a case against plot. That is to say, we have dreams and he thinks the dreams are not narrative at all. Dream, his interpretation of dreams published in 1900 and been worked, had been worked on for five years was part of an attempt to, to buttress his theory that there is some cogitation of a, of a deeply emotional and free-thinking free nature below the level of our awareness that, in an, in, that he locates hypothetically in a place called the unconscious. And the, 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 the system from which he draws the evidence that there is some thinking going on that is not conscious thinking, he draws from uh, essentially from dreams, he draws them from uh, legends, myths, uh, and uh, he draws them also from slips of the tongue. Uh, in the psychopathology of everyday life, he's dealing with errors made by people where they say something that they probably didn't want to say by a, what appears to be by accident, but which looks like the intervention of some demonic other uh, who's making you say what you don't really want to say in public, but what you might very well think. 